Amen. Amen. All right. So if you turn in your Bibles to Galatians chapter 5, um, this is the last sermon in our series called Wise Up in Proverbs. It, um, today's is a super just non-confrontational topic, addiction, right? <laughs> super easy to handle that one. Uh, but we're going to do it anyway because it, I believe it's beneficial for us. Because I think some of, you, some of you knew that the sermon was on addiction when you came in this place and you probably thought to yourself, well, this is a good Sunday for me to check out because I'm not addicted to anything. Because immediately what we think is hard drugs and, and drunkenness and all kinds of stuff like that when we think addictions. But the reality is, is there may be a lot of little addictions that have lied dormant in our life or perhaps we um, take part and pleasure in. And so we're just going to tackle it. We're going to talk about it. And it gets messy and sticky, but that's okay because we're a family and we, we, we're going we're gonna to get through it. So um, Galatians chapter 5, starting at verse 1, Paul writes, For freedom Christ has set us free. So stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. And look down at verse 13. For you were called to freedom, brothers. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you but bite and devour one another, watch out that you are not consumed by one another. But I say, walk by the Spirit. And you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the spirit. And the desires of the spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other. To keep you from doing the things you want to do. But if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident. Sexual immorality, impurity, Sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. And I warn you as I warned you before that those who do such things or practice quite literally such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, and envying one another. Father, thank you so much for your word. I thank you that when we come across passages or topics that aren't always so fun to talk about, we don't have to avoid them. God, I pray that this morning you would soften our hearts, that you would open our, our minds to receive all that you want to say to us here this morning. We want to hear from you. That's why we're here. Help this not to be some type of intellectual exercise or something that we can just check off of a list of things we did this week to make us feel better about ourselves. But God, I pray that it would be our heart's desire and intention to meet with you. So I lift these things up in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Not long ago, while I was visiting California, I ended up having a conversation with a friend of mine that, man, I've been friends with him. We go way back, like freshman year of high school. And, um, and in talking to him, I, I quickly realized that, that he wasn't walking with the Lord anymore. He had kind of departed from the faith, was no longer going to church. And you have to understand, this dude grew up in a Christian home. Mom was just a, a phenomenal woman of God who raised him up in the ways of the Lord, prayed over him, encouraged him. And so I asked him, I'm like, bro, what happened? Why aren't, why aren't you going to church anymore? Why, why aren't you in fellowship? Why, why have you departed? And 
His answer was interesting. I thought it was going to be something like, oh, the pastor's an idiot, because pastors are idiots. But it wasn't. Instead, his answer was, every week that I went to church, the message was the same. And I said, well, what do you mean by that? The guy only had one sermon? No. Every time I went to church, all I ever heard was, try better, and I'll see you next Sunday. Try better, and I'll see you next Sunday. Try better, and I'll see you next Sunday. And I thought to myself, man, am I doing that? Because I could see right where he was coming from with it. Sometimes when we come to church, we can almost get these um, self-help messages that are kind of just wrapped in, in gospel wrapping paper, right? Where it's like, Jesus is the answer, but you got to try harder. Jesus can transform your life, but why aren't you doing more? And, and, it, and it's over and over and over again. We get pounded over the head with this idea that our salvation is dependent on us. Our sanctification is dependent on us. How good or not good of a person we are is dependent on us. And, and I'm not trying to absolve us from all responsibilities in the matter. The Bible does call us to walk in step with the Spirit of God. But the simple fact that so many can walk away from a church service and believe that their salvation is dependent on them and where they are in life is, is so much so dependent on them and how hard they've been trying. And oh, you're struggling in that area? Well, well, guess what? You need more effort. And the Apostle Paul's intention in writing uh, the letter to the Galatian church was to inform them that they have been set free to live free. He wanted them to understand that the reason Christ had set them free was so that they would live free. And I wonder how often we realize that for ourselves. Because as Christians, we, we do live differently. We're called to live differently. The Bible is very clear about that. We should live our lives with a desire to honor and please the Lord in all that we do. Now, do we always do that? No, we don't. But that should be the desire of our heart, to honor and please the God who has given everything for us. Every day, we should be seeking to live our lives to please the Father. But listen, it's never going to come by you trying harder. <laughs> It's never going to come by you trying to muster up enough strength so that you could just be the good Christian that everybody thinks you are. It's not going to happen. Religion and the law want to put the onus on you. And I grew up in that. My family, I grew up in a, in a um, well, not really, right? They, they just called themselves religious people but didn't really practice. And so I, I saw often, though, this desire and this effort to do good in order to earn better standing before the Lord so God would be pleased. And I saw it all around me. And, and that's what religion and the law does. It puts the onus on you to put forth more effort. So it's important for us as Christians, as people who are, are God's chosen people, we, we are His kids, it's important that we understand that we have been set free from the shackles of human achievement. That this idea of, of self-help approach is ever going to make us more like Christ is only going to leave you frustrated. Know that the life that we live is a life that we should be living in the Spirit by the power of the Holy Spirit, but also that that right living is never going to come by more effort. And if you think that it's going to come by more effort, you're only going to find yourself like my buddy on this carousel of disappointment over and over and over again with a feeling like you're disappointing God and you're disappointing yourself. And, and it's, it's just frustrating. But, but here's the deal. There are people both inside the church and outside not just outside, but inside as well, that live with the struggle of addiction. 
And so what do we do about that? How do we address that? I know that this morning you didn't walk in this room here today and say, well, you know, I'm struggling with addiction, so I'm going to go to church and get that taken care of. (laughs) Probably not. Some of you may be. (laughs) But most people don't walk into church saying, well, I have a problem with addiction. But we all in some way, shape, or form have little addictions in our lives that um, need to be not managed but killed. There is a, an individual named Ed Welsh, um, who's a, a biblical counselor, who he had written a, a definition of addiction where he says, addiction, dude, the speaker's in my way, unbelievable, I'm having to come way over here, and addiction is a sin that you cannot seem to stop because it has great power over you, and in this way, it is a self-selected enslavement to an idol. What a way to define addiction as a sin that you cannot seem to stop because it has great power over you. And in this way, it is a self-selected enslavement to an idol. Now, there is some statistics I want to spit at you. Uh, The most recent comprehensive study of American addiction was uh, the 2014 National Survey on Drug Use and Health. And this study uh, indicated that in, it was 2004, okay, that, um, next one, 21.5 million American adults ages 12 and older battled a substance abuse disorder in 2014. Over 7 million Americans aged 18 to 25 in 2004 battled a drug use disorder. Almost 8 million American adults battled both a mental health disorder and a substance use disorder or co-occurring disorders. Only 10.9% of the individuals who needed treatment in a specialized facility for a substance use or dependency. I don't even know if that last line makes sense or if I just wrote it wrong. Next slide. (laughs) But the uh, NSDUH, that's the National Health Department, um, reported that in 2013, more than 95% of those who needed specialty, specialty substance abuse treatment and didn't receive it, didn't even think they needed it. So many of the, 95% of the people who were struggling with these addictions didn't even realize that they needed help. They didn't even realize that they were struggling with an addiction. And so Paul here, um, I just want to make this abundantly clear on the outset that in Galatians chapter 5, Paul is implying throughout that the church of Galatia, had to deal with this issue of the works of the flesh. And that the works of the flesh um, implies that we all have uh, little addictions. Maybe as we read through that in the very beginning and you were reading through verse 19, you're like, doing good in that area, doing, I never murdered anybody. Okay, um, well, I stink in that area. And, and like, as you're reading through them, you're like, oh, okay, we're creating our own little uh, checklist there. But the reality is, is we all have little areas of struggle, things that we wish we were doing better or were better in. In Romans chapter 6, Paul writes to the church there in Rome um, that you are all a, we are all a slave to something. And it's very easy to understand when we break it down this way. You're either a slave to sin or you are a slave to righteousness. You are either a slave to your uh, sinful lifestyle, lusts, pleasures, desires that rule over you, or you are a slave to righteousness and the God of righteousness. But there is no in-between, Paul says. Paul, Paul says that sin is something that we are born with. And I am well aware that as you walk through these doors, some of you, it's 2018, this is New York City. Are we seriously talking about sin? Sin has become like a cuss word, right? You don't talk about sin. How dare you? Who are you to say what sin is and and what is not? Well, I I don't know, but the Bible does, and God can, because he created everything, and you just got to deal with it, right? So, So, but God calls out sin, and what sin is, is sin is missing the mark. None of us are perfect but God, and sin is just the areas of our life where where, we're missing the mark. 
And I think all of us can relate to that. There, there's nobody, if I said, raise your hand if you've never made a mistake, you've, you've never done anything wrong, you've never thought anything wrong, nothing that you've done has ever been with uh, ill motive. I mean, if you raised your hand, you would fall into that category because you'd be lying, right? So we all fall into that category. We were born in it. We were either a slave to sin or a slave to righteousness. And Jesus says in the gospel that we cannot serve two masters. You cannot serve two masters because you will either, you, you will love the one and you will hate the other. I know uh, a good friend of mine, another friend in, in California who um, for a long time struggled. One foot in the church, one foot in the world, just, just desiring to give his life to the Lord, but never fully giving it to the Lord. And so because he never fully gave it to the Lord and, and, and sought to walk in the spirit, oftentimes his life was a mess. And I could see the internal struggle. I don't know if you know people like this or this is you perhaps, but I could, I could physically see the internal struggle he was going through. Just wrestling with what he knows he should do and what he is doing and likes to do. And I watched week after week, month after month, year after year, until one master gave way to the other. And to this day, he does not walk with the Lord, though he knows God is the way, the truth, and the life. He knows that God is the truth. He knows that the Bible is the truth. He does not walk with the God of the Bible, though. Because you cannot serve two masters. You may be able to do it for a season, but that season will come to an end. And you will either get serious about the things of God, or you will stop going to church, You'll stop communicating with believers who may hold you accountable and you'll want nothing to do with God. And as Christians, we struggle with sin too, don't we? Let's just be real. You know what I mean? Because when people, when they come in off the streets and they don't know the Lord and we, we, we're so pretentious and we pretend that, well, I don't struggle with anything. I got it all together. I go to church on Sundays. No, you don't. Stop. <laughs> okay? Let's just stop. But when we, when we pretend that, that everything is okay all the time and we don't just take a step back and say, man, I, I stink sometimes, perhaps even most of the time. <laughs> I make mistakes a lot. We all struggle in, in different ways. The difference is as believers, we're no longer enslaved to it. We don't have to do it. It is no longer our master the Bible says in, in Proverbs chapter 24, verse 16, that the righteous fall seven times, but the righteous get back up. That's the, that is the Christian life. That is the Christian walk. The righteous fall seven times, but seven times they get up. We just keep falling and getting up and falling and getting up by the grace of God. But we keep pursuing. We keep, we keep pressing forward. But the righteous fall. David fell. King David the man after God's own heart, the Bible says. He also struggled with little idols in his life. He, he struggled with sexual sin. And that sexual sin led him to murder somebody. The man after God's own heart, right? Noah. Noah, in order to cope with his issues, turned to a bottle. The rich young ruler, his idolatry was his possessions, his money, his stuff. He was stingy. He was greedy. He wasn't willing to give those things up. And so, so understand, Christian, <laughs> I don't mean for this to be depressing. Understand, positionally, positionally, Ephesians tells us that we are seated in the heavenlies. Uh, Jesus has gone to prepare a place for us. My mansion is going to be real nice. Okay, he's up there. He's preparing a place for us. Our position in him is saved, sealed by the Holy Spirit. We are justified just as if we'd never sinned. When the Father looks at you as a Christian, he sees an individual that is covered by the blood of Jesus. He sees an individual that is clothed in the righteousness of Christ. And so positionally, we're there. Practically, <laughs> We're still fallen people in a fallen world just trying to navigate it. Just trying to do our best to honor and please the Lord with our life. And this is called the sanctification process. 
This is the process of life in which, which as we walk with the Lord, he's, he's making us more like Christ. We never become sinless, but we start to sin less. It, it, it's, I'm not who I once was, but I'm not yet who I will be. That is the sanctification process. So, so what are those areas in which you're missing the mark? Think about it. Don't raise your hand. Don't shout it out loud. I don't want to know. <laughs> but what are those areas? What are those areas where you're missing the mark in your life? See, because more often than not, addictions are not imposed on us, but chosen by us. More often than not, addictions aren't chosen by us, um, or rather aren't imposed on us, but chosen by us. Whether that's sex, drugs, entertainment, uh, my iPhone, uh, you know, money, shopping, whatever it might look like, things that were meant to be pleasurable, we begin to shackle ourselves to them. Self-selected slavery. Some of the addictions that um, the Proverbs speaks about are found all throughout it. Chapter 5, chapter 7, chapter 23. The adulteress worships sex. The sluggard worships comfort. The greedy or the stingy worships money. The proud worships himself. The drunkard worships alcohol. The glutton worships food. You find it all throughout the Proverbs, the book of wisdom. I'd encourage you. Listen, there's 31 chapters in Proverbs. Every day, every morning you get up, just read a chapter. It'll take you the whole month, and then you can start all over again, but it's jam-packed full of wisdom. And it'll help us to take inventory of our own lives, our own minds, our own hearts. Man, are there areas in my life where, where I, I've got some idols set up? Are there some things in my life that I'm addicted to? Now, let me clarify something, and, and this, is, this, this part of the sermon is why I wanted to hide under a rock beforehand, because sometimes you gotta, you got to teach things that are that the Bible's pretty clear on, and um, they're just not easy, though. It's not, let's be honest. Sometimes you, you're teaching something, and it's not, you know, you, you come into church, and you want cotton candy and chocolate truffles, right? But you get broccoli and carrots, and you're like, oh, my gosh, this is a tough one to swallow. That's okay. We're going to have a barbecue after. Be happy. <laughs> but listen, um, <laughs> we need to clarify that there is a difference between sin and disease. Some of you are in college right now, and I know that your professor has told you that that's nonsense, that sin is a disease. Let me tell you something. Um, sin may give you a disease, but sin is not disease. <laughs> there is a difference between a sin and disease. The world wants to pander our sins. It wants to pamper it and coddle it, and, and God wants you to kill it. And so there's a big difference there. What we end up doing is, is we, we do our best to manage our addictions, manage our, our sins. But God wants you to do away with them. And when addiction becomes a condition to be managed rather than a sin to be repented of, we're in trouble. We're in trouble. It's not so much a disease as it is a worship disorder. It, it's misplaced worship in your life. And it's very troubling for me when I see those in higher education creating charts and categories in which they lump things like, uh, I'm just picking one, I'm not picking on this specific, this is your struggle, I'm not picking on you, okay, I don't know your struggle. Um, but, but they'll lump things like alcoholism, disease, cancer, disease, and I'm like, wait, hold on a second, um, do, not, do not belong in, in the same category. They don't belong in, in, in the same category. So, so what ends up happening when we just pander our sin and call every sin that we struggle with, when we start just, just calling it, well, it's just a disease. What that, what that implies is it, it's something that um, has happened to you and, and not something that you've chosen to do, right? And, and it, it, it absolves us of any type of responsibility to uh, make things right or to repent. And why well, I, I, I repent? I mean, why should I repent? After all, it happened to me. I, I didn't choose to open up that bottle and put it to my lips and drink it and swallow it. I didn't choose to do that. It happened to me. And, and so, so what ends up happening is 
we find ourselves doing what the world does best, and that's playing the victim. And we're always a victim. It's always somebody else's fault. It's never our fault. We don't ever take any responsibility for anything that we do. And, and please don't get me wrong. There are um, some social sciences behind addiction that are very helpful. Right? They're very helpful. They, they help us to understand some of these social addictions when it comes to the mind and when it comes to the, the, the heart and, and, and the body and chemicals and how they all uh, work together. But here's the deal. They never get to the root of the issue. The Bible gets to the root of the issue. The Bible gets to the root of the issue, and the Bible calls addiction idolatry. It's the reason people are addicted. And that's a heavy word, but it's also a misunderstood word. For some, this statement that I just made about addiction being an idolatry, for some of you that makes you very angry, and, and I understand. What I'm not saying what I'm not saying is that, is that you recognize your addiction as an idolatry. I'm not saying you recognize it as an idol, but I will not tiptoe around this issue and I won't do it because I believe that, that the Lord may want to set some people free here this morning from some things that have hold of you. And if we keep coddling it, you're never going to get through it. <coughs> We've got to not manage it, but get to the root of it, which is idolatry. And so when we put all of our efforts into stop doing this, stop, do stop drinking, stop smoking, stop sinning, stop, 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 stop. But it never leads us to worship the eternal one. There is a disconnect. When we're constantly trying to stop doing something, but we never start doing something else. When, when we constantly are trying to reject the idols of addiction in our life, um, but not turning to the only one who can set us free, what we're ultimately doing is trading in one idol for another. We trade in one idol for another. And so we, what we end up doing is like, well, man, I, I, I stopped all the hard drugs. Now I don't do any hard drugs, but what I've done is I've turned uh, that in for pride and now I just go around talking about how great I am and I stopped all of that and I didn't need AA and I didn't need a self-help program I didn't even need Jesus look at me and all of a sudden we're so welled up with pride that's how the dude who stopped smoking turns that over for Twinkies and now weighs 700 pounds and is like but I don't smoke anymore because we're turning in one addiction for another addiction rather than killing the addiction and surrendering it to the Lordship of Jesus Christ when I say idolatry, I know that some of you are thinking primitive people who build statues and bow down to them and stuff. That's not what I'm talking about. Idolatry is actually a major theme throughout the totality of Scripture. Genesis to Revelation. The Bible says that you and I, we were created to worship. Did you know that? You were created to worship. And that every one of us will worship something. Romans 6. It'll either be God or it'll be our own fleshly desires. We were created to worship, and the problem is, is we constantly find ourselves worshiping things that aren't worthy of it. And when we do that, we find ourselves then spiraling out of control, trying to find fulfillment in the creation rather than the creator. That's why the Bible, the Bible defines... Idolatry is this. In Romans 1.25, um, Paul writes, They exchanged the truth about God for a lie. And they worshipped and served created things rather than the Creator who is forever praised. This is the way that the Bible defines idolatry. And that can be food, it could be sex, it could be drugs, it could be an adrenaline rush, it could be anything that you're elevating to a position or place that is way too important. Right? That's why we hear people say things like, well, I just can't, I can't, I can't, fill in the blank, I can't, I can't. It doesn't mean that there aren't psychological reasons why it's so hard to get rid of certain things but my point is simply that it just started with idolatry. You may be in a place today where it's that and some. And now you've got 
some real chemical issues and chemical problems that, that perhaps even need medical attention. But to always blame it on someone or something else is just, it's foolish. I have a family member who, who man, I love with all my heart, you know. And about a decade ago, she began doing heroin. And to this day is still on heroin. And most days we don't know whether she's dead or alive. We never know where she is. She's been in and out of jail. And, and just recently, over the last few weeks, I felt like God has been convicting my heart to, to really press into laboring in prayer for her. But here's the deal. A lot of people, perhaps scientists or doctors, would like to say things like, well, she, she is a heroin addict because her parents were heroin addicts or her grandparents were heroin. There's never been a heroin addict in my family. She made a bad decision, a bad choice, and, and she's reaping the consequences of that. And it's my prayer that she would um, repent, turn to Jesus, and find times of refreshing. And that can happen because I have many friends who have been heroin addicts, many friends who I've had to step in and intervene due to hard uh, drugs where they were spiraling out of control and on their deathbeds. And I've seen Jesus set them free. And it doesn't have to be heroin, but, but my friend Paul in Spain was a heroin addict for 16 years. And I can remember when his wife was pregnant and he relapsed and getting him on a plane and flying him back to Scotland to get in this isolated place where he could go to detox. And then after detox, he could go to this, this Christian rehab center where it was going to be gospel-centered so that he could really find true freedom. And we got him there and, I, and, and, and then I left and then I get a call. You need to come back. He, he left detox and then he left detox and then he overdosed and then he was in the hospital and he was this close to death. And he ended up meeting the Lord there in a hospital bed and turning his life around. Went, went, went to that rehab center. Committed his life to Jesus and saw the Holy Spirit, the power of God's Spirit, work so profoundly in his life that now he's got three kids, another one on the way. He's, he's walking with the Lord. He's teaching the Bible. He's doing an incredible work there in Mallorca, Spain. But it didn't happen because he tried harder. It happened because God intervened. And he received all that God had for him. And he allowed God to empower him to live the life that God was calling him to. God gives us many uh, descriptions and pres prescriptions of, of ways in which we should live our life in Scripture. But he never says we can do it without him. And when we try to do it without him, we find ourselves again frustrated. Wondering why it's not working out for us. And the moral of the story is this. You can do all that you can do in order to free yourself from the bondage of sin, but unless you deal with the root of the issue, idolatry will always find a way to worship again. Whether it's finding a new idol, or whether it's like Paul describes in Galatians, um, returning like a dog to its vomit. Because that's what we do. That's what we do. Idols promise, but they do not deliver because they're liars. Idols promise, but they do not deliver because they're liars. Proverbs chapter 5 speaks about it. Proverbs chapter 7 speaks about it. Proverbs chapter 23 speaks about it. Thomas Brooks wrote, wrote, wrote of idolatry like this. He says, idolatry is like the hook. Idolatry is like the hook. And your sin of choice is like the bait. And the enemy is just waiting by to reel you in over and over and over again. And under that bait is a hook. The, the Proverbs read in Proverbs chapter 5, verse 3, Solomon writes, For the lips of the adulterous woman drip honey, and her speech is smoother than oil. There's the bait. But, here's the hook, in the end... She is bitter as wormwood, sharp as a double-edged sword. Her feet go down to death. Her steps lead straight to the grave. Proverbs chapter 7, you got a young dude who's seduced by a married woman. 
And it says that good time he hoped to have led to death. Proverbs chapter 23 speaks on uh, alcoholism. It's not that alcohol is a sin. I'm not saying you're, you're in sin if you drink beer or wine. I'm not saying that at all. I'm not saying alcohol is a sin, but alcohol as your idol is a sin. If alcohol is what you run to to cope, it's a sin. If drunkenness is something that is constantly visiting your life, that's a sin. Perhaps even an idol. We will always worship someone or something, which is why we must deal with the issue of idolatry. We've got to deal with it. Is idolatry, uh, is it, it, it's a hard issue. So, so it is, does it affect the body? Yes. Does it affect the mind? Yes. It, it, is it sometimes chemical? Sure, absolutely. But ultimately, the source of it is a hard issue. Proverbs 4.23 says, um, out of the uh, springs of your heart flow the issues of life. Guard your heart, the Bible says. And too often we try to change behaviors rather than changing heart. And it doesn't work that way. Ezekiel chapter 14, the first eight verses, you don't have to turn there, but you can jot it down and read it later. Ezekiel 14, the first eight verses talk all about how idolatry is something that is birthed within our heart. It's birthed within our heart. See, idolatry is far less about what we possess and far more about what possesses us. It's a heart issue. It's finding our worth in someone or something other than God. It's finding our identity in someone or something other than God. It's finding our comfort in someone or something other than God. It's finding our security in someone or something other than God. It's ultimately a heart issue. And that is what the Apostle Paul is dealing with. I love what Martin Luther says. He asks this great question. It says, Ask and examine your heart diligently, and you will find whether it cleaves to God alone or not. And if you have a heart that can expect of Him nothing but what is good, especially in want and distress, and that, moreover, renounces and forsakes everything that is not God, then you have the only true God. But if, on the contrary, it cleaves, your heart cleaves to anything else of which it expects more good and help than of God and does not take refuge in Him, but in adversity it flees from Him, then you have an idol, another God. Culture is trying to change behavior. God seeks to change your heart. And that's the difference. If you want lasting freedom, you need a new heart. Here's the beauty of it. The Bible says you can have one. The Bible says that if you confess your sins, He is faithful and just to forgive you of all of your unrighteousness. You can confess your sins. You can receive Jesus as your Savior. And check it out. He takes your heart of stone and He gives you a heart of flesh. The Holy Spirit then comes and invades your life. He enters into your life and He helps you. He helps to reorient your worship disorder. We live in a culture with, with people, places, and things that have been set up to be our functional saviors. And it never works out in the end. Your idol will ask you to trust it. Your idol is a liar. As you give yourself away, you sacrifice to that idol. And it will always leave you empty, and it will always leave you dejected. And some of you think that I'm being mean today. And I would say that I couldn't be being nicer. I'm helping you understand that you cannot manage your problem. But if we can identify it by God's grace and His Spirit, we can kill it and find freedom in Jesus. You can have freedom today. It's not a hypothetical. You don't have to wonder if, if Jesus is going to... He will set you free. If you choose to place your trust in Him, He will forgive you of your sins, and He will give you a new life. But you need to know that you cannot overcome your addiction, your idolatry, your sin by yourself. The world may tell you that you have it within you. No, you don't.
<laughs> you don't have it within you. It's not within you. The power to overcome it is not within you, nor does God ask it to be. As a matter of fact, Galatians chapter 2, um, verses 2 and 3, it says, let me ask you this. Did you receive the Spirit? Listen, pretend the Apostle Paul is asking you this, Christian. Pretend he's speaking this directly to you. Let me ask you only this. Did you receive the Spirit by works of the law or by hearing of faith? Are you so foolish? Having begun in the Spirit, are you now being made perfect by the flesh, by your efforts, by your... You say, is that how it works? We receive Jesus. He gives us His Holy Spirit and now it's up to you to make everything right. He says, no. He who has saved us will also sanctify us. And too often we have this incredible gift in Jesus, this incredible gift in His Holy Spirit. And it remains as this gift on a counter, unopened, collecting dust. Too many Christians are trying to live the Spirit-filled life but are like a really nice car with no gas. It's like, well, look at me, I'm a Ferrari. Yeah, but you're not going anywhere. So all the people that you're seeking to impress by how pious you are, <laughs> it's going to get old. It's going to get old. You'll never please God or overcome by trying to keep a list of do's and don'ts. And I don't want people to ever come to this church and walk through these doors and think that they can make it if they just try harder. They can overcome if they just try harder. And, and we'll end here in, in Galatians chapter 5. Look at verse 16. He says, But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. We got it being read over there for us. Praise God. It's all right. It's all right, Mother Teresa. You're okay. Don't be embarrassed. <laughs> Some people steadily feed their flesh and, and wonder why they don't find victory in the Spirit. I'll never forget an individual who, who approached me after I had received Christ and he sat me down and he said, listen to me. It's as if you have two dogs living in you, the spirit and the flesh. And these dogs are constantly at war with one another. Galatians says make war with your flesh. He's not pulling punches. Make war with your flesh. He told me this. He said, listen, one of the best pieces of advice anybody's ever given me. He said, the dog who will win is the dog that you feed more. So if you spend time constantly feeding your flesh, you shouldn't expect to find victory in the Spirit. But if you spend your time feeding the spiritual in fellowship with one another, in the Word of God, spending time cultivating a prayer life, you're like, I don't even know what to pray. Just pray about whatever you... Whatever, man. Just talk to God. Having brothers and sisters around you in community that can keep you accountable. Getting plugged into a community group. Doing things like this that will, will help to actively feed your spirit. Because as you feed the spirit dog, you will overcome the flesh. As you walk in the spirit, you will overcome the flesh. But if you choose to feed the flesh, you will never find victory. I love that he doesn't talk about the things to avoid. Just... just because it would be terrible if it was just a list of things that just avoid this, don't do that, don't do this. Now, he does in verse 9 give us the desires of the flesh, but I love that he gives us the things to expect as the fruit comes from living in the power of the Holy Spirit. Look at verse 22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. Man, when you read a verse like that, does that not fire you up? I'm like, man, if just I've received Christ. He's given me His Holy Spirit. He's given me His Word as a lamp unto my feet to instruct me. Now, as I... As I Seek to walk in the Spirit. These 
Verse 22 will be the fruit of my life. I want these things to be said of me. I want when my wife or my children or my neighbor or my coworkers look at me, I want them to say, man, there's joy. There's peace. There's, there's patience. There's kindness. There's goodness. There's faithfulness. There's self-control. There's love. Just reading the Word of God fires me up to want to be more like Christ. Makes me desire to, to put so much more effort towards feeding the Spirit. And again, I don't want to sound contradictory. I'm not saying that, that it's up to you. Praise God that when He gave you His Spirit, His Spirit changes and transforms the di- desires that are within you. He gives you new desires. Be obedient to those desires. Be obedient to those desires. You want to conquer addiction and idolatry? Look at verse 24. This tells you how. You want to conquer it? Verse 24, crucify your flesh. Give your life to Jesus. Repent of your sin. May He be your Savior, right? And verse 25, keep in step with the Spirit. Crucify your flesh and keep in step with the Spirit. David Guzik, he unpacks the the walking in the Spirit in three parts. He says that the Holy Spirit lives in you, that you are open and sensitive to the influence of the Holy Spirit, and then that you pattern your life after the influence of the Holy Spirit. It's this progression that takes place in our life. I love what uh, C.S. Lewis says. He said, he wrote in, in, in the book, The Great Divorce, When the beast of sin is put to death by the fiery sword of the angel, the killing of our addictive sin will also be painful. But on the other side of that death, there is freedom. Is there something that you desire freedom from here this morning? Are there some things in your life that maybe God is putting His finger on and you recognize that you've got to kill those things? By the power of of Jesus and His Spirit in you, some things need to be smashed. Because when we try to manage idols, when we try to hide idols, we fail to realize that that idol actually just desires to take over. It desires to be the lowercase g God in your life. And here's God's solution to it all. The Father sent the Son. The Son lived the life that we couldn't, died the death that we deserved, rose again on the third day, conquering sin and death. And then the Son ascended into heaven and sent the helper. Jesus sent the helper. Jesus sent the Holy Spirit. The Spirit of God to live in us, to bring transformation, to bring real gospel change. Because a lot of us want change and a lot of us wait till New Year's so we can make that new resolution that only lasts a week and then the gym is empty again, right? A lot of us are waiting for that. We're just waiting for that opportunity to make that change. Listen, those changes are so futile unless they're gospel changes. Unless Christ takes up residency on the throne of our hearts and we begin to walk in the Spirit. You can't do it on your own. And I'm grateful for this family here at Roots. I'm grateful that I don't have to do it alone. I'm grateful grateful that God hasn't called me to do it alone. I'm grateful for this community. And if Sundays are are just something that you check off the list and then Monday through Saturday you live for yourself, sadly you probably will will not experience and should not expect to experience that gospel change. But every day as we live with that conscious awareness that God who created the universe lives within you, will empower you to walk in step with Him as you pursue His Word, as you pursue fellowship, as you pursue prayer. As you just, as you walk in the Spirit. Some old dude, I listen, I've told my class a million times at the Bible college, I never remember anybody's name. I just quote them. I should just take credit, right? But uh, <laughs> some old dude once said, um, love Jesus with all your heart, soul, and mind and strength and do whatever you want. Because if you love Jesus with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, the things that you do will be aligned with the desires of Christ. Father, I thank you that, um, that your word is true, that it's applicable.